Good evening, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this humbled forum discussion, Law versus Justice, the Complexities and Opportunities of Restitution. My name is Eliza Appley. I'm a writer, producer, and moderator here in Berlin, and I'm honored to be hosting this conversation on such an urgent, intricate, and highly sensitive subject. This is the fourth event in the Humboldt Forum's year-long program, 99 Questions, curated by Michael Dimminger, who joins me here on stage. For those of you new to the program, 99 Questions is a series of live events and podcasts which together critically examine the colonial heritage of the Humboldt Forum and of Western museums more widely. Numerous objects on display in the Humboldt Forum arrived in Europe during the colonial period, often acquired by force and, by definition, in a context of deep structural inequality. In their removal and relocation, these objects represent the erasure of knowledge, languages, practices, and communities. They symbolize a context of violence and injustice in the past and the present. Together with international speakers and thinkers, and with our audiences, both here in the room and joining us remotely, 99 Questions is designed as a dialogue to deepen understanding of colonialism's historical impact and continued consequences, and to evolve a museum practice rooted in responsibility, justice, and the co-creation of knowledge. In this evening's conversation, we'll tackle the many challenges and the opportunities of restitution. Much discussed and debated, restitution is a key tenet of progressive museum practice and a foreground issue for the Humboldt Forum. The Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, a lead player in the Humboldt Forum, has already restituted objects to, Namib to Namibia, New Zealand, Australia, and Alaska. Earlier this year, the foundation formalized a commitment to return Benin bronzes to Nigeria. In recent years and months, there has been restitution momentum too from Scotland, France, Belgium, the United States, and the Netherlands. There is much, much more to do. In our conversation this evening, we'll be looking in particular at the role of the law and of origin communities in the restitution process. We'll ask who determines rightful ownership of an object? On what legal basis should negotiations between institutions, national governments, and local communities take place? How do we ensure that those local communities are involved in an equitable way? We'll examine legal models and precedents for object restitution, most notably of Nazi looted artworks. And we'll ask whether those precedents can help just restitution of objects acquired through colonialism, or whether they in fact perpetuate a Eurocentric logic and neo-colonial power structures. We'll scrutinize, too, what goes on behind the restitution scenes, examining the ways in which a much publicized object transfer might prop up other oppressive power relations or conceal another exploitative geopolitical arrangement. To explore all of these crucial and complex issues, I'm delighted and honored to now introduce our expert panel. Nazima Kamadine is a professor of commercial law at the University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Her research explores cultural property law with a special focus on post-colonial perspectives. Deploying third world approaches to international law, Nazima's work unravels how and why certain legal norms were codified and how they have impacted the rights of origin states to reclaim objects taken under colonial occupation. Welcome, Nazima. It's wonderful to have you join us. 
Winani Tebele is chief curator and head of ethnology at the Botswana National Museum. In this capacity, Winani facilitates the documentation, registration, and conservation of ethno-historic collections and related research. In her professional and her scholarly work, Winani has a particular focus on the colonial trafficking of cultural property out of Botswana, as well as other African countries, coordinating closely with local communities. Welcome, Winani. Evelyn Kampfens is an expert in cultural heritage law and currently postdoctoral fellow at the Museums, Collections and Society Group of Leiden University in the Netherlands. Formerly General Secretary to the Dutch Restitutions Committee for Nazi Looted Art, Evelyn's research investigates the intersection between private law and international heritage law and how a human rights framework might be applied to lost cultural objects. So welcome to you too, Evelyn. With me here on stage, as I mentioned earlier, is Michael Dieminger, curator of the 99 Questions series and coordinator this evening for all of your questions on the subject of restitution. Each speaker will be making a short keynote of 10 minutes, after which we'll open up to questions. And Michael will now explain how all of you, both in the room and joining us remotely, can participate in the questions, submit your questions and upvote other questions that you'd particularly like to hear answered. Thank you. Yes, dear audience, welcome. Dear audience in the room and on the virtual space. You can raise your question via the VoxR tool. I will explain shortly how it functions. It's really easy to use. So if you are joining us via the Humboldt Forum website, just click on the button who, calls, who says join the discussion. If you are using the YouTube stream, you find the link down below the description. If you are here in the room, just type in in your smartphone voxr.com slash Humboldt Forum. Um, after that, you can just raise your question and later on you can also vote for question raised. The top five questions will be shown to us on the stage and I will ask them for you to the, audience, uh, to the panel. You will also find the description of the event today and the biographies of our panelists. Thank you so far. Thank you, Michael. And please do all feel warmly encouraged to submit your questions. Now, to begin our discussion, we have a short opening statement from Karola Tilika, head of the legal department of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation. Carola has many years' experience dealing with cultural property confiscated as a result of Nazi persecution and with collection items acquired in a colonial context. Hello. Good evening, and thank you for asking me to kick off your debate with a few thoughts on the topic of this evening. The Humboldt Forum in Berlin has become a touchstone for a very lively debate on Germany's colonial past in particular and on colonialism in a broader context. One of the central themes of this debate has been the restitution or repatriation of both human remains and um, items that were acquired in colonial contexts. The question is, should these items be here? Should they be in the newly opened galleries or should they be returned to their countries of origin? Quite often in the debate, restitution is presented as the obvious thing to do and as a simple solution to make ma making amends for past colonial crimes. Stiftung Preußische Kulturbesitz has made it clear that we're very open to having serious conversations about the repatriation of items and human remains to their countries of origin. Indeed, over the past few years, initial restitutions have taken place, for example, to Alaska, um, and we're having other conversations about possible re repatriations. What we've learned and what we're still learning as we have these conversations, however, is that restitution is not simple and it's not quick and it's not a panacea. There are many complex issues that need to be resolved before human remains and items can return to their countries of origin. This is why the discussion you're going to have this evening is so important for us. 
any ideas that can help to resolve these complex issues are very, very welcome. What I'd like to do over the next few minutes is outline some of the issues that we've encountered. The first of these is simply, who do we talk to when we have these conversations around repatriation? And when we get to the point where we can repatriate, who are the right recipients for the items that should go back? On the one hand, there's the communities. When we do provenance research, obviously my colleagues are seeking to work with communities of origin or perhaps with scholars from the countries of origin. But when it comes to restitution, we have to define this a little more clearly. Who are the communities of origin? They may have changed since the colonial times, not least due to the effects of colonialism. There may be different ideas of belonging now. And there's a question of community leadership. Who is entitled to speak for communities which may not be formally organized? On the other hand, there's the government level. While most governments are quite happy for us to work with communities when it comes to provenance research, when it comes to repatriation, they would like to be involved in the conversation. They would like to have their say, and quite often they have different ideas to the communities. As a German national organization, we don't believe that it's our role to try and get involved in such internal debates or to moderate them. This is something that has to happen within the country's origin. On the other hand, we don't believe that it makes much sense to return items when such internal debates are still ongoing. I'd like to make clear that that doesn't mean that we want to be involved in the decisions on what happens to items or human remains once they return to their countries of origin. It's about not causing more pain by returning objects or human remains to the wrong person and at the wrong time. The second issue we encounter is the question of why do we return? Quite often in the debate, it's about returning items that come from contexts which are particularly unjust, perhaps because there was a particular imbalance of power involved in the acquisition, or perhaps if the circumstances of the acquisition were particularly violent. But as we work with partners from the countries of origin, we've learned that quite often it's not these objects that they would actually most like to have back. It's objects that have a particular significance. And of course, that makes a lot of sense. It could be a historical significance. It could be some sort of religious or ceremonial significance. Uh, but the question that arises is how and um, who defines which are the objects that are most significant and which would to go back? Quite obviously, it shouldn't be the German Museum. But this is where I circle back to my first point. There may be different ideas within the communities, and there may be different ideas between the communities and the governments of the countries that items come from as to which are the most significant items then significance may have changed over the years. Items that were not significant at the time, or not particularly significant at the time that they were acquired, may have gained a significance over the decades that they've been in Germany. Or else items may have become less significant. So any thoughts you may have on how we define how we find out which are the items that are most significant would be very welcome. My final question is, does it make sense to debate restitution on its own? Sometimes countries or communities would just like an item back, that happens. But as often as not, in our conversations, we found out that communities or countries would like restitution to be considered as part of a wider solution. It could be that they would like help with capacity building. Sometimes they would like help with building facilities where human remains or items that come home can be housed, can be looked after. But as often as not, it's not about material help. It's about an exchange of knowledge. Communities would like to know what we know about the items, what we found out over the time that items or human remains have been in our care. 
and they would like to share what they know. And most often as not, it's also about narratives. They would like to tell their stories and they would like the public to know their stories. So in this context, the question is, should we debate restitution on its own? Or should restitution always be looked at as part of a broader solution? A solution that can perhaps build sustainable relationships around these items and then that can perhaps contribute to a, a better long-term understanding. I would be very happy to hear your thoughts on some of these issues and I hope you have a very good and fruitful discussion this evening. Thank you. So thank you to Carola for those nuanced thoughts and many fruitful questions. I think this statement reminds us just how many complexities and opportunities restitution presents and how much scope for learning there is. So I'm delighted to now hand over to our first speaker, Nazima Kamadin, who joins us from Colombo to share her experiences and ideas for just restitution process. Thank you, Elisa. I would like to base my presentation on a PowerPoint, and I think you can see it now on the screen. And I would like to talk about the conundrum of colonial cultural property, because I think, as you already know, it's not a cut and dry situation. I have three beautiful images here, one of divinity, one of uh, ceremonial significance, and one uh, of something from everyday life. The key themes, uh, next slide please. The key themes that I'll be talking about is to try and define colonial cultural property because I think uh, coming as I do from a legal perspective, it's very important to set that framework. I'm going to talk about Sri Lanka's loss of colonial cultural property and the legal regime on colonial cultural property whether there is a moral regime on colonial cultural property. My view on the questions of provenance in relation to colonial cultural property. And finally, what I think is needed and why. Next slide, please. Coming to the definition, I, I think all of you are familiar with what cultural property is, but there is a special definition of colonial cultural property that has been coined. And I think it is very apt because it talks of an object of cultural or historical importance which is acquired without just compensation or involuntarily lost during the European colonial era. And I think those two points are very important. That there has been no just compensation or it has been lost involuntarily. So there has not been a great deal of choice uh, when this object has been, has changed hands. Next slide, please. The loss of colonial cultural property in Sri Lanka has been very well outlined by several scholars, uh, among them De Silva, uh, and there are over 5,000 objects in more than 25 countries, according to his catalog. These include prehistorical objects, art and antiquities, numismatics, palm leaf manuscripts, and anthropology. Next slide, please. The legal regime on the return of cultural property has also been documented and also by me in, uh, in an article I wrote a few years ago. I think we're all familiar with the fact that the UNESCO and UNIDRA conventions operate to stem the tide in uh, illegally trafficked cultural property. But what I find remarkable about them is that they have carefully excluded colonial cultural property from um, the framework that it, they operate in and therefore that it has created a vacuum for this particular type of property. Uh, the Committee uh, on the Restitution of Cultural Property is working on colonial cultural property matters, but it doesn't really have a legal basis, but forms more of a persuasive nature. I find too that the cultural property regime continues to evolve, but at the same time always denying protection to colonial cultural property. There is a regime on Nazi looted art that is evolving separately. And I hope that it will be successful and it could be also used 
to spark the debate on uh, taking the same kind of route for colonial cultural property. I find also that there is a move now to describe the intentional destruction of colonial property as a crime against humanity, which is one of the, the, the really uh, uh, very serious crimes that can be prosecuted uh, wherever the, the perpetrator is found. However, while the jurisprudence on colonial property continues to evolve, a glaring exception, as I find, is that colonial cultural property is deliberately left out of this discussion. Next slide, please. I argue that the legal regime on the return of cultural property is not set in stone because the current international legal regime that we still practice is based on the positivist Eurocentric sources that do have colonial origins. Its validity has already been challenged and disproved. As we have seen in the 20th century, natural law jurisprudence flourished, shaping human rights discourses and setting new legal norms. Next slide, please. Jurists such as Angie and Porras, uh, who have spearheaded the third world approaches to international law, have examined this legal structure that was operative in the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries and argued that this legal structure effectively disabled the native in the colonial confrontation, even as it made him the prime object of its investigation. And Ironically, it is that same law that still operates in this particular area, whereas in human rights, in labor law, in environmental protection, we have moved to the more natural law-based jurisprudence. And the, this particular legal regime does not support as a legal right the return of cultural property lost during the colonial era. One of the problems that I find here is because Western Eurocentric jurisprudence supported the absolute ownership of the state. So if it was a victim, if it was a colonial overlord, it was then their absolute right. While the Eastern view was that of guardianship. And if we have a little time in the discussion, I would like to talk about how the concept of guardianship evolved in Sri Lanka and how it was respected by all rulers after the advent of Buddhism into this country. Next slide, please. Then I would like to talk about whether there is a moral regime on the return of cultural property, because all the colonial cultural property that is being returned now is returned on the basis of a moral compulsion, there being no legal background. So the ICPRCP works to restore cultural property. I know that this very forum has been operative in uh, instrumental in the University of Aberdeen, returning cultural, uh, colonial cultural property on the basis that it was immoral to, retai to retain it. However, in a conference in 2018, um, a philosopher said that waiting for the moral instincts of art owners to kick in is a bit naive, and I think we need to acknowledge that. Also, a moral compulsion will not override a legal right. So if you were to look at it from the point of view of a museum or a country that was holding this kind of property, how would they defend their actions to their public? To their public who may feel that they have a right to something because it has been with them for so long. So we have to consider that also. The moral regime is backed by a loose concept of justice. But as has been pointed out in uh, the, the opinion on the legality of the threat or use of nuclear weapons, uh, this is nothing to do with nuclear weapons, but this is about what justice is that we always think that our position is right. We always think that we all come from the moral high point. But then there are different versions of justice. So that is also something to think about, that justice may not always be universal. Next slide, please. I know I'm not a, I'm not a historian, and I know that provenance research is important. Uh, to maybe find out about the origin and, the, and uh, the authenticity of the object. But I would argue that in the case of colonial cultural property, it is not useful because the vanquished is not in a position to make records and there's no guarantee that the victors would outline their theft. I would argue that the provenance of the objects found from Sri Lanka's point of view in this very comprehensive catalog that was done by uh, the museum uh, curator, uh, PhD H.D. Silva in the 70s, uh, which outlines more than 5,000 objects, 
should be treated as authentic because it was made with the cooperation of the museums and collections concerned. And if indeed he did misrepresent that an object not originating from Sri Lanka did originate from Sri Lanka, there's plenty of time, there has been plenty of time to refute those statements. I have found from my own personal experience that this provenance research has been insidiously used to find out if the vanquished still retains any ownership documents. And I, for that reason, I do not believe that um, provenance research is as useful in relation to colonial cultural property as it is in relation to other types of cultural property. Next slide, please. Now coming to the modes and reasons for restitution, uh, one of the most recent cases that Ethiopia has requested the return of certain altar tablets that the British Museum had in its possession and never displayed. And experts have recommended that they use a loophole in the 1963 British Museum Act uh, to give back these objects saying that they're unfit to be retained and can be disposed without detriment to the interests of student. So you can see the, the, the great pains they go to to find out a way to return the object without ever having to compromise on the legal regime surrounding colonial cultural property. So the idea seems to be this legal regime is set in stone. It can't be tampered with. But let's try to find loopholes uh, if we want to return objects. I argue that the British Museum Act is only a piece of domestic legislation. If the international legal regime were to mandate the restitution of colonial cultural property, then domestic legislation that violates international law could not be supported. So the British Museum Act would then also have to be amended accordingly. And uh, uh, tiptoeing around this issue and finding such complex loopholes would not be needed. Next slide, please. Then, in fact, what is needed? I argue that since 1945, we have constantly evolved legal regimes for various purposes. We look at international environmental law, for example. We have taken such great strides in talking about how the polluter pays and the deeper pocket theory, the principle of absolute liability, things that international law had never heard of before. So why not for colonial cultural property? I mandate that, or I, I state that a new legal order that first affirms the right of the home state to its colonial cultural property must precede any discussion on restitution. Because at the moment, restitution is whimsical, ad hoc, and it may be abused. Without a proper means, there's no point arguing for an end. Because what we are doing then is we are having private dealings. People are uh, countries that exert more pressure diplomatically or politically may be able to recover their positions while those who do not will not because there's no le real legal right. And before the restitution takes place, if it does, I believe that the legal order must first be created that supports and identifies the rationale for why it should be done. Otherwise, it just becomes a meaningless exercise. I think we must admit that the basis of law and justice that we have been operating on are flawed and we must be willing to seek a good compromise. And I believe that the wrongfulness of the taking of not only colonial cultural property but all cultural property without just compensation and in circumstances where it is detrimental to a nation or community's cultural identity must be recognized and accepted. For example, Tara is the only female embodiment of the Buddha, and Buddhism is Sri Lanka's main religion. Without the statue, the, the community here is deprived, is denied of an object of worship, something that brings them spiritual joy and satisfaction. But it's just an object in the British Museum. Next slide, please. And then I want to talk about why it is needed. Why do we want to have these discussions about cultural property? By now, we have accepted that culture is a universally accepted right, is a right to culture. And I don't believe it can be fully enjoyed or appreciated if its symbols are away from home, as indeed is the case in Sri Lanka. I'm supposed to be the proud inheritor of a heritage of more than 5,000 years, but the museum in Colombo is largely empty. I also know that there are economic implications of colonial cultural property that cannot be ignored. For example, I could access Colombo's museum for less than one euro. 
but I couldn't get a visa to England, uh, take a plane there and visit the British Museum all for one euro. So there's, a, a, there's an economic implication when objects are far away and they are away from the reach of the common man or woman or child uh, in, in, in its home country. And I argue that even though communities that are born today have not seen, have not witnessed uh, how these objects were lost, yet there's an element of historical injustice that continues and it will continue to fester in the minds of the former colonies. I'd like to leave you with the quotation from Franz Fanon, where he says, culture under colonial domination is a contested culture whose destruction is sought in a systematic fashion. It very quickly becomes a culture condemned to secrecy. It couldn't be more true. So thank you for this space and this forum, and I look forward to the discussion that is to follow. Thank you so much, Nazima. And I'm very glad to now hand over to Winani Tebele to take the virtual floor. Perhaps we, perhaps we go to you, Evelyn. It seems Winani maybe has a connection problem. Whatever you want. I see her. Do you want me to start? Yes, I think we'll, we'll, we'll proceed with you, Evelyn, if that's all right, and hope that, that Winani reconnects in just a moment. Okay, so um, my slides, you are in charge of them. So could I have the first slide, please? I don't see them, but I hope you will see them. Yes, we so, see them. Oh, yes, yes. So could I have the next slide, please? Yes, so as an introduction, I thought to start with a press release about a Benin bronze statue offered for sale. You see the press release here. And it announces a fair and just solution with the family of a Jewish collector whose artifacts had been a subject of a forced Nazi sale in 1934. Now that collector appeared to have been a keen um, uh, collector of African art and had acquired a number of Benin bronzes shortly after the pillage of the Obas. Oh. Now, I don't want to complicate matters uh, with this introduction. I just want to pose the question to you, who is the rightful owner here? And make my proposition that perhaps we should rephrase that question and ask, whose lost heritage is at stake? And if we take that outlook, I think, from a legal perspective also, uh, where we get stuck in, in uh, looking at these matters as a matter of ownership and if either state ownership or private ownership, if you look at it as heritage, I think that um, human rights law offers prospects and can help structure the fields. Now, I will try to explain this proposition by taking a case example. If I could have the next slide, please. Yes, my, my example concerns the so-called Bangwa Queen, an iconic work of art that today is in Paris. And here on the left, up, is pictured while on show in the Musée du Quai Brandy in 2017. In the 1930s, she was photographed by Man Ray, you see it there on the right, uh, featured in exhibitions such as this one in 1935, there on the left down, and before that, uh, at exhibitions like this one in Berlin in the 1920s. Could I have the next slide? She starts her life in the Bangwa area in today's Cameroon, and she's the ancestor figure and was to be kept in the shrine of the ruling chief that was von Asongiani, here depicted on the right. She was dispatched to the Berlin Ethnological Museum in 1898 by colonial, uh, German colonial uh, agents, along with many other Bangwa artifacts, and some of which are still in Berlin, and some were sold in the 1920s, such as the Bangwa Queen, and make it, made it to other collections. Although how exactly she was uh, lost uh, account on that uh, differ, what is certain is that it was during the period of a series of colonial punitive actions during which the chief was captured and exiled and his quarters were looted and burned down. Nothing new in that area. Many uh, such punitive actions uh, took place in that time. 
In 2011, if I could have the next slide, please. In 2011, the Bangwa Queen was exhibited in uh, New York at this exhibition, and she was recognized. And the ruling chief at the time uh, traveled to New York and identified her. And in 2017, they sought contact with the French owner who refused to meet or enter into a dialogue. And the reaction of the Bangwa representative, I think, speaks volumes. Refusing to meet with us is a preference for a confrontational solution. Now, some observations at this point. Firstly, the meaning of the Bangwa Queen varies in time and place. Secondly, she became the tangible symbol of the humiliations and injustices of the time. And in the third place, keeping the door shut will have a boomerang effect. We should not let this window of opportunity for reconciliation pass by. Leaving that, uh, such observations for what they are, what about the legal context? Could I have the next slide, please? It is often heard that no legal standards exist in this field, but here I disagree. The question is whose laws do we apply? Under Bangwa laws, she was inalienable and could not be privately owned or sold. Just like under Roman law, for example, sacred works were also res extra commercium and you could not sell them. So under Bangwa law, this was the case as well. Yes, it changes from a, a religious artifact into an artifact, let's say, and under French ownership law, such artifacts undoubtedly uh, are owned, legally owned, by a new possessor uh, due to limitation periods under ownership laws. Now, from the perspective of international law, one would normally focus on the unlawfulness of the taking at the time, at the time that was the law of warfare. That's how international law uh, in the West started. And here, I think one could well argue that looting in the course of military actions at the close of the 19th century was unlawful, also under the standards of the time. <laughs> Throughout yeah. history and in most cultures, cultural objects have a protected status, and one of the founders of international law, uh, uh, are, as a Dutch I like to quote Hugo Grotius, for example, already in the 17th century, excluded cultural objects from the right to pillage in times of war. And in his turn, he referred to Cicero and Polybius. So this development continued. And in 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, restitution of dispersed cultural objects was acknowledged as a principle of international justice. And that rule was eventually codified in the first international convention, the Hague Convention of 1899. Nevertheless, uh, as Nazima also said, it was not it, international law was uh, an exercise amongst a very limited group of civilized nations. And such an approach will encounter many obstacles. Mostly uh, courts do not like to look at events in the past. And most importantly, Western holding states generally did not acknowledge any legal responsibilities in that regard under the argumentation that such objects are of universal importance and preservation should be key. Now, a notable exception is a 2008 Italian verdict on the return of the so-called Venice of Sirene. So there is, it was, it, the, the court said that uh, the Italian Supreme Administrative Court held that the right of self-determination of former colonies implicates that cultural objects should be returned. However, that was an exception, and generally, such a deviation was not acknowledged. In my view, therefore, a human rights law approach offers better prospects. In such an outlook, not the unlawfulness in the past, but the heritage and identity values of cultural objects for people today is key. Could I have the next slide, please? Over the last years, you see that cultural heritage law uh, has become increasingly interrelated with human rights law. Uh, it's called the humanization of cultural heritage law. And it comes down to the acknowledgement that cultural heritage is a necessary ingredient for the realization of human rights. 
Now, in this sense, for example, the Human Rights Council in a 2007 resolution, which was the start of a series of resolutions in these fields, underscores that cultural heritage is an important component of the cultural identity of communities, groups and individuals, and of social cohesion. And another example is the, the definition of cultural heritage in the so-called FADO Convention on the Value of Cultural Heritage for Society, um, and of central importance to our topic, I think, is the right of access to culture as it developed from the right to culture in Article 15 and in many human rights instruments, but most importantly, Article 15, Section 1 of the binding international covenants on economic, social and cultural rights. Now, although this may still sound rather vague and unspecific, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples of 2007 is very specific in its rights. Indigenous peoples in this respect have the right to redress through effective mechanisms, which may include restrictions with respect to cultural property taken without their free, prior and informed consent. The right to access, use and control of ceremonial objects and a straightforward right to repatriation of objects containing human remains. Now, on itself, uh, you often hear the UNDRIP is a non-binding resolution. Nevertheless, today it is considered to be the implementation of the binding right to culture in as far as it concerns indigenous people's cultural rights. And in my view, I think this is an important legal instrument in the field of colonial takings. And in at least one case that I know of, the 2017 Brazilian Kimbaya case about colonial uh, uh, trophies taken to Spain, the INDRIP was referred to by the Brazilian Supreme Administrative Court in establishing that under today's status of customary international law, indigenous peoples are entitled to their lost cultural objects. To sum up, what we can see here is a development that these instruments uh, and, and instruments that all focus increasingly on the heritage interest, not anymore on uh, cultural objects as property, as state property or as individual property, but also on the, the social context of uh, and the heritage interest and identity values involved. So this brings me to the notion of a heritage title as opposed to an ownership title, as a legal tool to address identity values and disputes over cultural objects. This is merely a label for rights that already exist and are evolving in international law. And I think it's important because, first of all, it relies on a continuing cultural link between people today and the objects they identify with, the rights involved are defined in terms of access, control, or return, or equitable solutions, not in terms of exclusive ownership. And this means a shift in focus from the unlawfulness in the past to present-day interests, and a shift to international uniform uh, norms, whereas ownership law differs in each country. And in the third place, a focus uh, on heritage title enables the classification of objects, depending on the identity mm -hmm. values involved and the social function of specific objects, rights may arise. Sacred objects or human remains obviously score very high on that scale and artifacts intended for the trade lower. Now, a last important reason why such a human rights mod model might be used useful in my view, is that it enables access to justice to source communities. Human rights are, more or less, universally applicable, and this opposed, as opposed to ownership law. Now, to conclude, I obviously do not want to pretend that the law can solve all the complexities raised with the issue we're talking about today. Nevertheless, as a lawyer, I strongly believe that a legal framework is needed to give a voice to source communities. This is not just a matter of ethics or morality. Injustice of the past call for justices, justice today. Since cultural objects are not just possessions, but also heritage, a human rights model might offer that universal legal language. Thank you. That's Thank it. you very much, Evelyn. And I think we can now reconnect with Winani for your presentation. 
Okay. Thank you, Elise. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you well. Hello. Hello. Okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'll just uh, go into my presentation. Uh, my take is that restitution is a very broad and complex process. Therefore, there's a need for an ethical approach uh, to restitution by countries since it involves a, a problematic heritage and sensitive history of colonialism. There is need for proper consultations uh, by the concerned parties and exchange of notes. This then uh, talks to the issue of um, provenance research where we really have to delve deeper into the available collections and to know more about them, uh, the involved culture and history. Uh, provenance research would then also determine uh, who the recipient communities are and who the communities of origin are so that we open dialogue with the right people because we've had instances where there is a debate uh, after we've started communicating with uh, communities and thinking that these are the original um, communities, and then we have others coming to say no, but we are the rightful uh, owners of this uh, heritage. Hence, it is important to go uh, deeper into research to really determine who uh, the heritage belongs to. And then engaging also with communities of origin over the colonial collections will determine which the in, uh, in alienable positions are, their value and why it is urgent to return them first above uh, the other uh, colonial collections. And engaging with the communities of origin will also determine whether there are other issues to discuss besides restitution. Uh, in this instance, we think of uh, the Nama Herero case in, in, of genocide in Namibia, where there's the issue of restitution, and they've also uh, demanded reparations uh, from the German government, and they've even gone to court. So it is by engaging with the communities of origin that you get to know what they really expect uh, besides uh, restitution. There's also need for relevant laws and legislation like my colleagues have just pointed out in order to guide the restitution by individual countries so that the exercise is domesticated at, at a national level through the right uh, uh, legal structures. And the role of the community in the whole exercise of, uh, of developing uh, uh, legal structures is also very, very important. They should be part of the machinery that coins the, the laws that govern the colonial collections from the onset. Uh, we've ha we have uh, instances where countries go ahead, they develop laws, they don't involve uh, the communities of origin or indigenous communities. And you want to go back and take the whole exercise to them and want them to be a part of it, whereas they've not been a, a part of the, uh, they've not been uh, involved in the a commoning of the laws, and you feel they feel at some point that they are not really addressing, you know, critical issues that you know affect them. So it is also important to involve them from the onset. And there should also be a clear role by the government, uh, so that the, there is no clash between the interest of the community and that of the government. Uh, quite often, this this is. Also, the example of in, in, in Namibia, where the government has gone ahead and negotiated with the German government over the colonial co uh, issue and restitution issues. And the communities has, uh, uh, have felt they've been left behind, that they're being sidelined, and their issues are not being addressed. And they've uh, left the government and decided to take the German government to court, you know, without now involving the government. So you feel now there are two entities that are now negotiating with the German government. So it is important to look at both interests of the government and, and the community so that there's synergy 
in uh, the negotiations. We don't end up, you know, entangled in in in, in uh, local issues. The the role of the community, uh, you know, it is quite often museums also struggle alone. So it takes time for some governments to buy into efforts uh, on uh, restitution. The Botswana example also would uh, count here. Uh, in some governments feel they have priority areas. They, they are concerned about education, they are concerned about the health, and you find that it is only heritage uh, institutions that are really interested and, and um, venturing into uh, opening up dialogue with uh, countries that or the museums that hold uh, our colonial collections and the government is left behind and without buy-in by government it becomes very very difficult to get into issues of restitution because you need the government to support you you need it, it needs funding so therefore that's one area that really uh, has been problematic in some uh, african countries and that needs to be uh, dealt with um, uh, carefully. Um, the, the involvement of government helps with funding since the restitution project is usually very expensive, sensitive, lengthy, and needs planning and a concerted effort in where we sometimes we even use bilateral uh, uh, agreements between us and, and countries that hold our uh, colonial holdings. The involvement of communities of origin also and provenance research, the involvement of governments helps in determining what the fate of the objects after a restitution is, because we also have instances where uh, the objects have been returned back to countries of origin, and there's really no clear plan as what is going to happen to the objects, whether they're going back to the communities or they're going back into museums. So it is really important for all these key stakeholders uh, to get together and, and have a, a clear stake in the restitution exercise so that uh, all these issues are taken care of, you know, so that there are no debates after uh, the collections have been returned back. And also, also that there's a, a clear plan as, as to what is going to happen to, to the collections. I think the Nigerian example would be a good one because the government is really taking a leading role uh, in the issues of restitution, and there's, uh, there are preparatory moves uh, where they, they've even decided to build uh, structures that are going to accommodate uh, all the restitution uh, cultural properties. So I think these are also issues that uh, come into play uh, in the whole process of restitution. There's also a need of cooperation uh, between countries, which is something that the Southern African uh, countries in Africa uh, have uh, uh, initiated because we share boundaries and in some countries like Botswana where the museum concept is still very young uh, some of the collections are in the neighboring countries we share communities so it is always important to work together you know towards issues of restitution because some of the collections are going to be moving from next door and back uh, to uh, countries of origin so it is important to work together in the development, development of laws uh, towards uh, restitution. This is uh, an exercise that is uh, handled smoothly. There are no uh, uh, debates and no, no, no misunderstandings in between states towards issues of re uh, restitution. And the restitution is, issue is, also, is therefore a project that involves many actors, the experts uh, in museums, the communities of origin, governments, uh, and the media. It, also, it is also a, a good step towards the decolonization uh, of the museum. So I think that is uh, what I have for you this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Winani. And we will open up now for the question section of the evening. So just a reminder that VoxR is open and please submit and upvote your questions. I'd like to begin by addressing this real inadequacy of a legal framework for the restitution process, almost in effect a legal vacuum in which restitution processes are currently 
taking place. And perhaps I can go back to you, actually, Winani, and, and just ask you mm -hmm. what that absence of legal channels, of legal rights, means for the communities on the ground, both in practice, but also emotionally? I think the absence of a clearly uh, stipulated uh, uh, legal structures is, is problematic because that is why in some instances uh, there is misunderstandings when the, the, the collections come back, it is not clear as to where the collections are going to go. And it is also sometimes a, 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 a complex issue because there is nothing to guide the, 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 the uh, restitution for, for states. So I think it is important, something that is in place that guides what happens to the collections, how they are restituted back to countries of origin, and what happens to the collections when they are now back uh, with the countries and uh, the involvement of uh, both experts as well as the communities of origin. And this would also probably be talking to whether it is uh, necessary to even establish museums uh, would go. So I think legal structures will be talking to all this so that uh, this is an exercise that uh, runs smoothly and everyone uh, sees themselves as a, 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 as taken care of so that we, are not, we don't feel some people are left out. Thank you. And in the absence of this legal framework, I'd like to explore also a little further what we are depending on currently for restitution to take place. Is it the campaigns on the part of origin communities? Is it political will? Or is it a moral consensus within an individual institution? Perhaps I can ask you, Evelyn, what you see as the main driving factors right now and what shortcomings those other non-legal motivations pr provide. Uh, yes, thank you, Eliza. Well, first of all, I, of course, disagree that there are no legal norms, because I, I, ha I think there are, and, and there have been over 20 uh, UN and Na United Nations General Assembly uh, resolutions on the issue, so since the deep period of decolonization. So there has been a molar of pressure for a very long time. Of course, uh, for a very long time, it has not been acknowledged as a legal right. And the downside of that is, um, and that's a bit similar as in the field of Nazi looted art in, in our countries also, where we see it's, it's, it's a moral, we think, we feel ethically and morally obliged to do that, but you don't really are in, you're not really entitled to it. So it's, it's lack of recognition and that's an insult to an injury, one could say. I think it's important to the recognition. And um, yeah, and perhaps a more practical point is that uh, you get ad hoc decision makings. I mean, it, it, the political, of course, the political will to do it is hugely important and, and political gestures, but in the end you will get inequalities and high political sensitive cases and other cases that are not equally looked at, perhaps. And in, in tackling the, the Eurocentrism and indeed the colonial logic that's embedded in international law, Nazima, I'd love to, to ask you, how do we begin to go, uh, go about creating a just system in a framework of injustice? Thank you. I think the first step had been to define colonial cultural property as being something separate from ordinary cultural property. And that invests it with a separate identity. Of course, there has to be consensus among the major states uh, that make up the membership, United Nations, or some uh, comparable body of uh, representing in international law. And from there, I think the negotiations, I, I do agree with everything that has been said by the other speakers also. But I still think that if there was a very compelling legal regime, we would not be seeing what we are seeing now. If there was 
a very strong international obligation to which states have ratified the convention, then they would not even be uh, promulgating domestic law that prevents them from returning objects. So from negotiation um, through identifying what really uh, should this framework be, I believe like we had started, I mean, we got the UNESCO convention only in 1970, just like that, we should have another international instrument that deals with this issue of colonial cultural property, or we must include that definition into one of the international conventions that are already present dealing with cultural property and include this particular area as a separate topic to be discussed, identifying its unique nature and also the constraints relating for, to, for example, recording, uh, provenance research and so on, which is problematic in cases of co colonial cultural property. And I do believe that from the, the research I have done, that restitution without a legal basis is not only harmful to uh, the entire regime on colonial cultural property, I think it's also embarrassing for the host states of colonial cultural property because without a proper legal basis, I can't imagine how even those uh, decision makers would face their constituents. You touched there, Nazima, on those domestic laws, which were also mentioned in the presentation, the British Museum Act of 1963, that's cited as a prohibition for disposing any items in the collection. Uh, in France, the Heritage Code stipulates that all collections are inalienable. And these laws have frequently been cited to stonewall restitution requests. But as, as you mentioned, Evelyn, there are precedents also for revisiting these laws and relaxing these restrictions, uh, not least the Washington principles that apply to Nazi confiscated art. Could you tell us a little more about that precedent and how useful is it with regard to colonial cultural property? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, well, it's the interesting uh, fact is that the Washington principles are uh, are hugely successful. So there, there, it's it's a set of uh, some principles that. Uh, in the field of restitution mainly say that uh, countries should um, foster, should, should promote just and fair solutions uh, to ownership matters according to the situation or the circumstances of each case. And expressly, these uh, principles were also made non-binding. So in fact, it's, it's nothing more than the ICOM code, ethical code, that already also provides soft law, let's say, or private regulations on the issue of restitution and return. But they were, it, it, there was just the political will, of course, to live up to that. And um, from, from, from a situation where it was first only for state-held museums, the whole private markets also, um, uh, by to them in a way that it came to a point where it's not um, not done or you cannot sell a work anymore, you cannot possess a work anymore if the provenance is not all right. Um, so it, it, it has meant a shift. Anyway, I think that the, the, what we can learn from that is that uh, yes, the political will and, and such a declaration on a certain moment by many countries is very important to give it a push. On the other hand, I think also that we should learn from this after 20 years that uh, without clear standards, which is also the case in the field of Nazi looted art because there aren't, it's not legally binding, um, the more difficult cases get, uh, well, it, it's also a matter, it may be also a matter of ad hoc decision making, politici politicization, um, and uh, not, you know, the, 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 what you want as a lawyer is that equal cases are decided equally on the basis of certain standards. That's, that's what the law is for. And in the absence of that, it may become uh, very unclear and, and legal insecurity. Thank you. 
I'd love to open up now, Michael, to questions from our audience. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just hit that we are already like a little bit late, 10 minutes, but there are a lot of interesting questions in there. I would like to rise to all of, of now just two, but all of three of you a uh, question. The first question goes to Nasima, with got the most votes. Uh, Nasima, could you elaborate more on the concept of guardianship uh, versus ownership maybe, and how could it be extended to international law is the question. Yes, thank you. The concept of guardianship itself was, was introduced to Sri Lanka when the Buddhism, message of Buddhism came, where uh, the, the Arahat Mahinda, he found the king hunting on, on, on state land. And when the king was about to shoot the deer, he told him, you can't do that. He said, you may be the king, but you're the guardian of all of this. You're not the owner. So even you don't have the right to destroy any of this. Taking that to heart, even the kings of Sri Lanka once an object was commissioned, they never would touch it even to gift it to someone and they would never take it for their personal use. So if they wanted to give something to a travel to a visiting emissary, they would commission a special object for that purpose. So whatever was created, whether it was a statue or whether it was an object that was gifted to the king, he still did not use it. It was kept as a part of what the public should have. The concept of guardianship comes in through the sustainable development concept, and we see it now even in international law, where the state is supposed to take decisions for the greater good of the community. So if you are uh, going to approve a power project, you need to see whether under sustainable development principles, it's going to be good for the rest for the entire country. So how this concept of guardianship is opposed to the concept of ownership is if the, if the king or the conqueror is the owner of everything, they can take everything. But if you are the guardian, you have to look at the best interest of the person to, of whom you are the trustee. So guardian is you're like a public trustee. Then there is a person or there's a group of people uh, in, in whose name you are holding this property in trust. And then it becomes their best interest, not your personal enjoyment, that is the standard. So if you were to take then whoever is in charge of controlling the country, whether it's a democratically elected government or whether it's a colonial overlord, and you apply the concept of this public guardianship or public trusteeship, then you look at is the removal of this object for the greater good of this community or not. And if it's not, then you don't remove the object. So I think that is a fundamental difference between how even property ownership and state guardianship is viewed at between certain Eastern cultures and uh, certain Western cultures. And that's the point uh, that I was really trying to make, that that's a very useful way of looking at uh, colonial culture property. Hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you. Um, Vinani, there's one question, um, because I like that, like, your concept of a museum goes beyond the nation state, it goes beyond the border. And there's one question that doesn't got so much both, but I think it's also important to understand. The question is the concept of communities that do not equivalent to national cultures seem to be difficult to understand for Europeans, maybe. Here, do you think this could be explained to better make the complexity of the multiple stakeholders discussion to a broader audience in Europe? Could you? elaborate a little bit on the communities and the complexity. We can't hear you at the moment. Minani, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Give us a second for solving this problem. Try it again. Maybe, Vinani, we come back to you later. We try to solve this problem. I'm sorry. Um, then let's ask a question also to Evelyn. Evelyn, there's one question which also goes to you. Um, I, uh, they, they told me you are, you are muted. Can you try to unmute you, Vinani? Um, if not, Evelyn, now we go to you and we come back to Vinani. Um, do you know, is there an international contact point for cross-border restitution processes or as process of cultural heritage of human rights at the UN? 
a central point. Well, uh, no, well, actually, under the UNESCO conventions, that are the main international conventions, there is not an. Uh, there, there, there was never. Um, uh, a process installed like uh, like the human rights uh, councils or, or, or annual um, reviews or something, but there is this committee that also Nazima uh, sets the uh, well mainly the the, um, UN, the UN Restitutions Committee, which was established specifically for the problem of colonial looted art that. While the 1970 conventions are the main convention, main treaty, international treaty that's uh, uh, against the illicit trade and and to that sets the norm that looted art should be returned, it specifically also said it's not retroactive, so it only uh, is for future cases. But then we will uh, establish this committee that has to deal because in the meantime, of course, there were many countries that said, yeah, but we have all these colonial cases and we want this, this to be addressed and then as a, that committee was established um, yeah and that committee comes uh, together every uh, two years or something and uh, discusses the issues but uh, until now at least my personal opinion is that the state setting of this committee makes all these and it's it's not a forum to solve the matters until today, but it is a forum where best practices are exchanged. But but like a, a committee, like the spoliation panel, or in the Netherlands, the, the restitutions committee, so like an alternative dispute resolution system, an international system. I think that would be a great idea, but there is not as present. Thank you, and uh, Vinani, you are back. Um, Maybe can you elaborate a little bit on the complexity of multiple stakeholders, as you as you mentioned in your presentation? Yeah, the, the complexity of multiple stakeholders is that uh, if they are not brought together so that there's a concerted e effort from the onset, uh, so that they also participate equally in the exercise of restitution, there's bound to be misunderstandings, there's bound to be arguments, there's bound to be uh, where the other parties are not happy, they feel they've been sidelined, they feel this should have gone that side. So it is always important to bring all the stakeholders to consult uh, widely and uh, uh, take the journey together so that uh, we, we agree, we do it together. At the end of the day, everyone is happy particularly the community and the government. The government is important. If we leave the government out, we can manage issues of restitution and the law as well. But still, if we leave out the community still, and then it is now the experts and government alone, then it's also very complex. So that is why it is important to make sure that all the key stakeholders, even the media, really, so that they publicize what we are doing, they, they share it with the international community. So it is important to take care of all the uh, important stakeholders. It's, it's a journey that needs a, a concerted effort. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I'd love to develop that, that point about origin communities and the negotiation that takes place between those communities and national government. You mentioned, Winani, the importance of involving national government, and there have been calls in recent weeks also for the government of Vietnam to be more outspoken on restitution matters. But at the same time, there are obviously circumstances in which national governments do not represent origin communities, and many scenarios in which restitution, as Evelyn alluded to, may in the hands of government be enacted as a geopolitical exercise and not as a point of principle. If we're thinking about universal legal frameworks, I wonder, Nazima, what you would see as the most reliable and realistic negotiation model. Can or should we be thinking beyond state-to-state -state dialogue? Yes. 
I find that sometimes in state to state dialogue, and this is from my uh, experience in investment law, what happens is when you have bilateral negotiations, there's always unequal bargaining power. And that we have seen in some of the issues that uh, have even surrounded uh, something called cultural diplomacy, where return of cultural objects has been tied to other benefits, such as, uh, am I going to get an investment from you or not? So in this uh, point, if we were to uh, identify some of the countries that have been colonies from which CCP has uh, flowed out, you'll also find that it directly correlates with uh, what we think are homes, uh, host states in investment law, and that's not a good model. I think you have to have an international model, one that talks about rights uh, in general, and not leave it to bilateral negotiations, because as I said, then it becomes whimsical and ad hoc, and it can also lead to ill feeling, not only in the host state. I come from a host state, but I can very well understand that there could be a lot of resentment in home states also, if you had an ad hoc uh, method for returning cultural property. Because it's been in those countries also for quite a long time. And those communities, I mean, people who are uh, forming part of those communities today, they've, they've also probably got used to seeing it as part of, uh, you know, their, what's in their museums I, and maybe having some sort of affinity to it. So unless you have a legal basis that is universal, that is agreed by everyone and that everyone can work with, um, it just remains a, a whimsical exercise. Evelyn, do you have further thoughts on that, on that question of the best and most realistic and reliable dialogue models? Um, yes, well, personally, I think that um, for a new treaty that would, um, that would take very long, and I, I personally don't think that that will happen very uh, soon, but what you do see, for example, and this keeps coming in my mind now also listening to the others, in the 1970 convention, for example, there is one article and it says, that all states uh, recognize the indefeasible rights of states to certain inalienable uh, cultural objects. And that's a principle, and that's a standard that, yes, I mean, okay, so, so in, in definition, you could not invoke that for prior cases, but what you see is that that idea behind it uh, gains uh, traction. You see that in, uh, in Nazi looted art, you see it in other cases, pre-1970 cases in lit that are litigated in the United States. Uh, there was this one case, uh, well, I, I will not go into details, but wh what I think is that um, there are already many um, uh, bases that we can uh, go further on, and there is there are legal norms that we can build further on. The, the, we should have some precedents. We should have some court cases, I would say, to to try out also to see how how uh, how the legal standards uh, are being um, taken at this point in time. So so practice through through uh, courts and and through through doing this, I think. Thank you. Michael, do we have any more questions from the audience at this juncture? Um, at the moment, it doesn't show to me. No, there, there I can see some more. Um, <clears throat> I think one question we got, uh, we came in pretty new, is uh, who should pay for provenance research? Are there any guidelines in the international law? Um, I don't know, maybe, Nasima, do you want to answer this question or do you have an idea? Well, I, as I said, I'm not a historian, and my only uh, experience with provenance research was a very bitter one. We would want to know why someone wants to do provenance research. So you want to make sure, for example, if you're restituting an object, that you're giving it to the right person. So you want to know more about the object. I would argue that if there are absolutely no records and you really want to make sure, then you would have to invest in the provenance research. I think it would add insult to injury to ask a host state that has already suffered so much, now you better do the provenance research and provide me the evidence as to really whether you are the one uh, that is uh, entitled to this property. And why I keep talking about the host state is because in Sri Lanka, except for a very, very small community of Adhikasis who've lost a few objects, 
The cultural heritage is so old that it now belongs to the entire community. It's not like in some other countries where you have identifiable cultural groups. I think what Winani is talking about, that situation doesn't really arise in Sri Lanka. So uh, apart from the Adivasis, the rest of this cultural property is all spoken for by the government and you know by the nation. So that's my very cynical view, of course, on Providence Research, but the others may have some, some other ideas. Maybe Vinani, do you want to add something? Hmm. Um, there, there are two questions, maybe we could ask them as the last statement. Yes, absolutely. Should I ask them now? Yeah. Okay. There are two questions which actually are pretty important. And I think there's also like one question asked, uh, what do you think is the best example of restitution today? And I will combine it with the question, uh, can, rest can restitutions be a venue for uh, restorative justice, also for like coming together and finding on solutions? Um, maybe all of you want to, I would like to ask all of you, uh, if you have a best practice example, and do you see restitution as a way for restorative justice? Uh, Evelyn, do you want to start? Oh, well, um, a best practice example. Well, I, pr I, I already mentioned this Kimbaya case, for example. I think that's a, a beautiful uh, case. It's, it's the higher, so it's a court saying that um, to its own government, really, uh, under this is the status of international law. Uh, our uh, uh, indigenous Kimbaya people are entitled to this, and you government, you should go and to Spain and you should negotiate that. And it doesn't matter really how you do it, um, just that you should try and do it. I think that's a beautiful um, example. And then um, I think also there are beautiful examples. You know the the, the guidelines that are presently. Uh, in Germany, in, in the Netherlands, in, in, in other countries. I think it's you can see it as the implementation of the UNDRIP, let's say, or in, implementation of legal rights. So I think also that's a good example. Um, and then the point on restorative justice, if restitution can be a form of restorative justice, yes, certainly, of course, that's in the human rights uh, framework more generally, of course, restitution is one of the uh, forms, but apart from restitution, and maybe there I can close also with coming back to what Carola Tilke said, uh, it should it only be about restitution? And I think also here it was mentioned, um, restitution is, is one of the forms, but you can also, uh, this provenance research, for example, I think is also important to, to as this narrative, the, the telling the stories that need to be told. Um, so it's, it's an acknowledgement of injustices. That can also be a, a restorative justice. Vinani, do you want? Yes, yes. I, I, I agree with the thinking that there should be an international model to, to restitution because then we would agree on certain clauses and, and certain expectations, particularly when you look at the example of France where they are saying uh, colonial objects are um, in alienable positions to France. If you think of the Vigango masks from Kenya, uh, that belong to a certain ethnic group who say, uh, since they've lost the, the masks, there have been a lot of things happening to the family, I mean, to the community, because these are such a part, an integral part of their culture. Uh, these are grandfathers. So if someone in Europe is saying these are inalienable, unalienable, unalienable uh, positions, then sometimes it's, it's like a joke. So I'm sure if there was an international model to restitution would agree on certain uh, issues uh, such that there's no clashes because if now the Vigango masks are in France and are needed by the community or the, the of origin and they are saying in Arenable, it's 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 so I think such 
And I also agree with the thinking that uh, restitution is like a, a restoring and closing, a, 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 um, closing, closing painful chapters. It's closing old wounds. It's really like a healing, you know, to communities of origin and uh, so that we start on a clean slate as uh, states. Thank you. Thank you. Nasima. Yes, and uh, if I may, I'd just like to give a, a small response to Evelyn. I mean, I, I respect the fact that she strongly believes that there are some uh, legal points at least, but I feel that if there was a very strong legal claim, then even after the UNESCO Convention, the British Museum Act would have been an illegal piece of legislation, but it's not. And if, in fact, there is an international legal regime that supports a legal right, then why would countries only be making requests? As far as I know, Sri Lanka has made several requests. If there was a binding legal right, they would then be sending a formal letter of demand or uh, using the legal mechanism. So while if, if there are legal provisions, then they have largely been ignoring the wider uh, scale of how conventions have been, um, have been explored and uh, how they have been given effect to. Coming to exam best examples of, of restitution, I know there are some examples of restitution, but I cannot say they're best examples because they're also done sans a legal framework. And then it's like, he who shouts loudest will, will get it. And then if we look at who's restituting and why, there may be other reasons uh, other than just, uh, uh, you know, prior altruism. And, and that may also cause a lot of problems. So I would think that, of course, there is, when we talk about uh, the, the justice, the, the historical injustice, it doesn't go away, uh, however long it takes. So there's always a feeling of uh, having been wrong, the feeling of resentment that can spill off, uh, spill out at any time or spill over at any time. And that's why I think that ultimately the legal regime must, uh, must reflect the fact that now this object is not mine to ask it's yours to give. And that should be the way it is structured, that then it promotes a dignified method of identifying this problem, identifying where we are at now, and providing a viable mechanism so that one day restitution may be done. Right now, people are just rushing through to it without really thinking about it. But what needs to be done is the acknowledgement must be there first. We've seen so many issues of historical injustice where even, for example, comfort women, sometimes they have said they don't want compensation. They just want closure. They want the acknowledgement that this was done to them. So that mm -hmm. is, I think, the first stage. And there may be some governments later on that say, you acknowledge this, but we don't want the object right now, or we don't want the object. We, uh, we are not in a position to even look after it. But why they are all, everyone is joining the bandwagon is because of this very fact, he who shouts loudest is receiving the object. Then there's immense pressure on others. Uh, you must shout loudly too. But what the most dignified method, I think, is to come at a legal definition and international consensus on first acknowledging that these objects were wrongfully taken, that they do belong to whichever country, and then looking at the other measures from there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nazima, and thank you, Winani and Evelyn, for being here this evening and sharing all of your expertise you've brought to this conversation incisive analysis and deep understanding, as well as hopeful, powerful, and actionable visions of how we can advance both legal tools and community engagement in the restitution process. We're really grateful that you joined us. Thank you. I'd like to extend thanks too to Michael and Julia Richard, who curated and produced this event, and to Michael for coordinating the questions this evening. Thanks too to the production and technical team, to the translators who have made this discussion available in German, and to all of you for joining us. In the next event in the 99 Questions program, we'll be taking a critical look at digital museum collections. Be sure to look out too for the 99 Questions podcast. 
The next episode is a double episode dealing with Germany's colonial crimes in Africa and asking why they are absent in official memory discourse. The guests in the first episode are Sima Lupert, chairperson from the Nama Traditional Leaders Association, and Nandi Mansengo, chairperson from the Overherero Genocide Foundation. In the second episode, we're joined by writer and researcher Zoe Samutsi and curator and artist Kathleen Bomani. The podcast is available on all regular streaming platforms. For now, heartfelt thanks once again to our speakers and to all of you for joining us. Have a very good evening. <laughs>